Amen. Keep your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. So tonight I'm going to preach on a subject that I haven't preached on um, standalone for several years. And I was looking back through my notes on this study and I've actually um, never preached on it in this way before. So I want to look at a specific um, topic tonight and that's the topic of envy. I want to talk about envy and what the Bible has to say about envy. What is envy? What is it not? Let's go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 14, if you would. Proverbs chapter number 14, if you would. And let's find out what envy is, first of all. Before we begin, let's look at what envy is. Look at um, Proverbs chapter 14, and look at verse number 30, if you would. Proverbs 14, look at verse number 30. You're going to keep your place there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Sorry, I forgot to tell you to keep your place there. You probably already lost it, but you'll have to go back there in just a few minutes. But Proverbs 14, 30, the Bible says this. It says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. So here we can see that envy is something that is bad. All right, The, di the dictionary definition of envy is this. A feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's, now don't, don't miss this, by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. So it's not necessarily just a, a material thing. It is something where, you know, you are longing or you have, you're discontented because of, you know, somebody's else's possessions, qualities, successes, luck, whatever that may be. That is what envy comes from. All right. And the Bible says that a sound heart is the life of the flesh in Proverbs 14, but envy the rottenness of the bone, showing that envy is a problem with our heart. Envy is a problem within your heart. Turn to James chapter number three. Turn to James chapter number three. So a common mistake in our world today, in people's vocabularies today, is people mix up these two terms, jealousy and envy. All right, so let's look at what the difference is between jealousy and envy. Because if you have a King James Bible in front of you, those two words are very different. In James chapter three, the Bible says this, it says, For where envying and strife is, verse 16, there is confusion in every evil work. So everywhere you see in the Bible that it says the word envy, it is a bad thing. It is something that is bad that you should not have. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Let's look at jealousy for just a few minutes. Let's look at jealousy. So what is the difference between envy and jealousy? So remember, envy is feeling discontented, or feeling upset over somebody else's possessions, success, their um, just, you know, even the luck that they've had in their life, whatever it is, over something that's happened to somebody else. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Look down at verse number two, if you would. Look, Paul says here in Second Corinthians 11 that he was jealous. So what does that mean? Look at verse number two of Second Corinthians chapter number 11. We're looking at the difference between envy and jealousy before we even get started tonight. For I am jealous over you, the Bible says, with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here the Bible is saying that there's a godly jealousy, right? Everywhere you see the word envy in the Bible, it's something bad. It's rottenness. It's a heart problem. But here the Bible is saying that there's a godly jealousy. Turn to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20. So Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Turn to Exodus chapter number 20 and look down at verse number 4. Exodus chapter number 20, look down at verse number 4. The Bible says in Exodus 20 verse 4, it says, Thou shalt make, not make unto, me, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. This is the, the Ten Commandments here. Or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them, talking about false gods, all right? Nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. It gets even better because in Exodus chapter number 34, like the Bible literally says that God's name is jealous. One of the names of God is jealous. So God is jealous over us, all right? He's He's covetous, if you will, over us. So jealousy, the difference between envy and jealousy is this. To be protective, to be covetous, or it's not even, covetous isn't even the right word. To be protective over something that is yours 
is jealousy. So a man can, be, can have godly jealousy for his wife. A wife can have godly jealousy for her husband. Though, be, why? Because they belong to each other. Right? Now look, you cannot have, if I have, you know, I'm not going to even use myself as an example, but if someone has, you know, covet somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband, that is envy, covetousness, and that is a wicked thing. So envy is being, you know, upset or discontented over something that somebody else has achieved or has in their life that does not belong to you. Whereas jealousy is just being protective over what is yours. God is protective over us. He's saying, no, no, no. He's like, I don't want you worshiping any other gods, any of these dumb idols. Don't be putting up any of these things. He's like, because I'm jealous over you because you are mine. So jealousy is a good thing over things that belong to you. All right. And look, what God, look, God is jealous over our attention. He wants our attention. He doesn't want us, he wants our worship. He wants our praise. You know, those are the things that God is jealous over. And Paul, just as Paul was jealous over the people, it's okay to be jealous as long as those things are yours that you possess, okay? So look, I mean, God wants, you know, your full attention. That's just a good um, sermon topic in itself. Numbers 5 talks about a husband being jealous over his wife. Jealousy is a good thing. It's just protecting what is yours. All right, so basically the difference between envy and jealousy is who owns what is what it comes down to. All right, now let's go to James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4. So all that to say this. Let's look at envy tonight, and let's look at where the roots of envy come from. All right, let's look at the roots of envy. Look at James chapter number 4. And look at verse number one. So now that we know what envy is and what it isn't, let's look at where it comes from so we can guard against it. All right, look at James chapter number four. Look at verse number one. The Bible says this. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of the lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. So the Bible is saying here is, is in verse number two, it's saying you lust after things. What is it saying? It's saying you want things. And you don't have those things, so you go and you kill people for those things. The Bible is telling us literally where war comes from. All right? It says you desire to have and cannot obtain. So what? You fight and war. So what are, where does war come from? War comes from the lusts of the heart. War comes from somebody that literally wants something. They want something that is not theirs. So what? They kill and they desire to have. Look at verse number three. But then God tells us how, how bad and how you know, misguided this is. He says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. So he's saying like, you're, you're, not even, you're not asking for things and when you are asking for things, you're asking for the wrong things. And then you just, you want the wrong things. So you go and you kill people. You lust after the wrong things and you will kill people for those things. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. What are, what's an adulterer and adulteress? That is somebody who is lusting after someone that belongs to someone else. Someone that is married to someone else. Ye know not that friendship of the world is en know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now look at verse number five, talking about envy. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? All right, so this is such an important scripture, especially for us today, because it's telling us that envy is born from lust. Envy comes out of lust. If you look up at verse number two, these people are lusting after something. They're envious of the people that owned that thing, whatever it is, land, power, people, whatever. And that is what, you know, causes all the trouble here. So number one, you want something that's not yours. You try to get it from the world and not God. And then people will literally kill for it. That's what James chapter four says. Is showing. I mean, but imagine what God is saying here. Imagine what God is saying. God is saying, you want something, 
Just ask me for it. Now, in the, in the sermon I preached, I think it was four years ago, I really focused on worldwide problems that envy produces. All right? And I really focused in on James chapter number four. And look, the macro level of things in this world that envy produces is war and evil forms of government. That's what envy produces. I mean, what is, what is communism born in? What is socialism born in? It is simply born of envy. It is born of people that are discontented, just using the definition of the word. People are discontented over the success of others, over the possessions of others. So what do they do? They implement a form of government to take those things from other people by force. That's what it's about. And that's, that's what I really focused on in the last, you know, four years ago when I preached on envy. And look, it's, it's something that should be focused on because in the past hundred years, it killed, this idea killed a hundred million people. This idea of allowing envy to rise up in people's hearts and, and just be, just manifest itself throughout the world killed a hundred plus million people. It's very serious. It should be preached on. But go back to first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We're not going to preach on that tonight. Tonight, all that was introduction. Tonight, what we're going to talk about in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 is going to be our core scripture tonight. We're going to talk about personal envy tonight. We're going to talk about personal envy in the individual heart tonight and the dangers of it. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And look at verse number 12. So this will be for our church tonight. All right, this isn't a sermon tonight. I already preached the sermon to save the world. This is just for you tonight. All right, this is for you, for your individual hearts, looking at envy. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And look at verse number 12. This is the verse of the week. The Bible says, for we dare not. Paul's saying, don't do this. We dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. What is he saying there? He's saying, who, who are people that commend themselves? These are boasters, right? These are people that are just like, they're constantly telling you how great they are. All they talk about is how successful they are. And there's an inherent desire when you see people talking about how great they are, how successful they are, for you to just jump in there and just join the ranks of that. Be like, well, you know, I'm great too. Well, I'm, you know, successful too, or whatever it is. And we'll look at some specific examples here that people do um, commonly, not, you know, not here, but I mean, just that you'll see commonly throughout your life. But he says, look, don't jump into that, is what he's saying. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. He's saying, don't join that game. He's like, that is a foolish thing to do. It is stupid to jump in. So you say, well, pastor, what should I do when there's this guy that whenever I'm around him or there's this gal, whenever I'm around her, all she's doing is boasting. All they're doing is boasting about everything that's so great. What do you do? Just let them talk. You don't have to go in and try to boast over the top of that. That's what verse number 12 is telling us. Look at verse number 13. And this is really what I want to focus on. But you have to notice when the Bible just keeps repeating certain things, okay? Look at verse number 13, and you're going to start to realize that there's a phrase here that's repeated again and again and again. It says, but we will not. He's talking about, he's talking to the church here. He's talking to the saved. He's talking to the people in church. He's saying, but we will not boast of things, what? Without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us. A measure to reach even unto you. Look what he's saying here. He says, for we stretch not ourselves, again, he says, beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you as also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Now look at verse number 15, and you'll see this again. Not boasting of things without our measure. That is, of, now he explains what, the, what he means. So he keeps saying, without our measure, beyond our measure, without our measure. And then he explains what he's talking about. He says, he defines what without our measure means. He says, of other men's labors. 
But he said instead, so what he's saying is, don't go boast. Don't go boast in things that, you know, you didn't do. Don't go boast in things that somebody else has done and you had nothing to do with. He says, but according to the measure of the rule which God had distributed to us, meaning there is something that God distributed to you, but don't go be boasting in other people's stuff. He says, but when your faith is in, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we should be enlarged to you, but according to our rule abundantly. Verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not boast in another man's line of things. Notice a pattern here. He's saying, don't just go and just like try to overdo what other people have done. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about being a one-upper, basically. He's talking about somebody that would, you know, come in and just, you know, start talking about something that they did. And then that person would just like start boasting in that person's measure. Like, well, I've done something similar to that or I've done something like that in the past. It's like somebody I'm just looking at Brother Benjamin here, like somebody has a has an IT job or something. And Brother Benjamin is talking about his IT job and things that he learned at work this week. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, well, I, I did that. Like, I've done that like four years ago. Like, I, I, you know, I mean, this is what he's talking about. Like, literally using somebody else as, you know, labor to boast within that yourself. That's what he's talking about. He's like, don't be that guy. You got to throw in your own story, you know. I mean, or you get upset. I mean, there's people that get upset when somebody even knows something that they don't even know. Right. I mean, talking about, you know, talking about, just envy and things people envy. It's not just possessions. It's not just successes. Like literally, if there's somebody talking about something where, you know, they're not in that conversation or they feel like that person is looking like the expert, they just have to just like jump right over the top and just like jump right within the measure of what that person is talking about. Look, I mean, look, we all do different things here as a church. And this is how every church is. Every church is filled with people that all do different things, that all have different professions, different talents. And look, one person's talent is without yours. I mean, every single one of us has, been just had, has had a distribution of talent to us. You could take me and put me in classes for years, and I could never paint something like Miss Korea paints. Never. Because that is something that that measure has just been given to her and like I I shouldn't try to like go into class and like I'm going to paint better than her one day. (laughs) This is what the Bible is talking about. You shouldn't even have that desire within you to be better than everyone in things that you don't even do is what the Bible is talking about. I mean, ladies, ladies can get wrapped up in this too. Ladies can get wrapped up We got a lot of little kids in here and we got a lot of babies being born here. So listen up, ladies, because ladies can get, you know, kids of all different ages. All kids will have different strengths and different talents. And, you know, I guess you could just be that lady because have you ever met this lady where her kid is the best at every single thing? Like whatever, you know, whatever your child did, mine's done it sooner better, faster, and, you know, gotten more awards for it, basically. So all people can fall into this, right? And look, the kids thing is a bad one because it's not even verifiable. You can just say things, right? You can just say, like, well, he's a genius, and he's, like, you know, two months old or whatever. Go to Psalm chapter 128. So how do you deal with envy? How do you recognize it? And how do you deal with personal envy? Personal envy. Look at Psalm chapter number 128. Psalm chapter 128, look at verse number 1. Psalm chapter 128, as a church, this is what we need to focus on. Psalm 128, we need to deal with envy. Everybody will have the, the, the initial desires of envy. It could creep in on anybody, all right? There's nobody that's immune from this. You can't say, oh, you know, envy, you know, envy is only for bad people. It's like, no, no, no. It could creep into anyone's heart. So we all need to be guarded against this. Look at Psalm 128, 1. It says, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and walketh in his ways. Look at verse number two. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So the first step to dealing with envy and not being an envious person 
is simply to get yourself together, is to simply have, you know, your own labor. I mean, live off the labor of your own hands, the Bible says. You are owed nothing in this world. Even though you may have been taught that everybody owes you everything, it's not true. You have to go out and, and labor with your own hands, teach your own children. Look, many people in this society are, are raised today that this society owes them something. And the fact is, it's not true, and it sows destruction in their heart is the problem. It sows envy in their heart. It plants covetousness that will lead to envy, and ultimately, I mean, ultimately, as we see in James chapter 4, it leads to violence at, at a societal level, all right? So the first step to avoiding envy is to just get your own house in order. Get your own house in order. You say, why does that apply? Well, turn to Romans chapter number 12. And let's look at verse number 15. Let's look at number two. How do we avoid envy? The first step is you get your own house together. Get your own act together. Get the things that you need to have under control, under control. Look at verse number 15 of Romans chapter number 12. The first or the second way to deal with envy and to stop it in your heart is this. Learn to rejoice with others. And I say learn because it is learned. Learn to rejoice with others. Look at Romans 12. Look down at verse number 15. Look at what the Bible says in Romans 12, 15. It says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. So the Bible is saying here, I mean, look, just look at the first part of that verse for tonight. But the Bible is saying that when somebody is happy, I mean, when do people rejoice? People rejoice when something good has happened to them. People rejoice when they are in a high point in their life. And the Bible here is telling us that, look, as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, when somebody's at a high point, it doesn't say rejoice with them that rejoice as long as you were already rejoicing. No, it says rejoice with them that do rejoice, period. Meaning, you could be at a low point, and somebody could be at a high point, and they're rejoicing, and you should rejoice with them. Look, if you want friends in this life, you need to learn to be happy for them when they have high points. And you need to crush any envious or, or competitive spirit within you. You need to stop that. And look, ladies, young ladies, ladies listening to this sermon, I've been thinking a lot about the qualities of, of like a, a, a good man lately. And let me tell you something, envy in a man is a, is a bad quality. If you have someone that, you know, you are considering, you know, if you're looking for a husband or, you know, you're thinking you know, about the type of person that you would want to marry in your life. Look, an extremely bad quality for a man is one, a man that is envious, especially of his friends. Look, it's, it's quite frankly, I mean, somebody that, you know, is a one-upper, somebody that can't be happy for other people, somebody that is just, you know, it's a loser quality. And you really need to be careful for it. And, and men, if you have envy that creeps into your heart, you need to get rid of it. You need to crush it. You need to stomp it out. You say, what, why did you say it's a loser quality? What, what do you mean by that? That was kind of a mean thing to say, Pastor. No, I mean, I literally mean it is a quality that a loser has. And you men know what I'm talking about. It's a quality that somebody, because, because here's the thing, winners don't do this. Winners are not envious. Winners, people that know what to do and how to get things done and know how to go out and labor and work for their families from a man's perspective, look, they're not envious because they just go get it. They just go after it. They just win. They wor they, look, they worry about their own and they get it done. That's, that's the type of man that we should all shoot at being. They don't envy. And look, they're extremely happy when their friends win. Envious people will eventually have no friends, is what 
it all comes down to. And look, people can tell if you're envious. Like your friends can tell if you're not happy with them. But strong men, strong men know what it feels like to win, to get it done. And they know that, look, even if they're down and their friend is up, they know that, hey, rejoice. We're going to rejoice with you. I know I'll get there. I'm not there now. My, my rejoicing may not be in the same area as your, in the same measure, as the Bible would say, as your rejoicing is, but I'll get there eventually. But see, the problem is, the problem is with men that become envious and that grows in their heart is it's, they, they just, all that rejoicing, it's just, it's unattainable to them in their mind. And so they just envy. I mean, successful men that are just going after it and doing what the Bible says they're to do, they know that maybe they have talents in a different measure, but they will get there. I mean, there's a lot of young men in this church. Look, you young men, I mean, some of you are, are learning different trades. Some of you are, you know, going into different things. And look, you are going to go in wildly different directions in your lives. In the next, in the next short few years, you will be going in wildly different directions. But be happy for each other. Support each other. You ladies, you're, I mean, there's all these little kids in this church, and these little kids are going to have talents that are wildly different than each and every other little kid in the church. Every single one of them. You just need to learn to be happy and to rejoice when others rejoice. And guess what? There's going to be, you know, down times, like with the ladies, maybe they're teaching. Maybe one lady is like, you know, I've got this thing figured out. And another lady is down here. But you need to rejoice with each other and, and weep with each other, quite frankly. It goes both ways. You need to be there and just not have that envious heart when somebody else is up and maybe you're down. But see, the problem is, it's those that know that or, or just aren't going to be diligent to go out there and, and to do it what they're supposed to do. Those are the ones that are the most upset when others are being diligent and doing what the Bible tells them to do. Look, so just destroy any budding envy. And look, you know what you're going to find out? You know what you're going to find out? You're going to find out that watching other people be successful is fun. That's what you're going to find out. If you can get rid of envy and just rejoice when your friends are rejoicing, you're going to find out that it is very edifying. It is, I mean, let me just give you a small analogy. I, I grew up hunting from the time I was, I don't know, really small. And the people that I, the friends and the people that I grew up hunting with, it was just kind of like, you had to be a gunslinger. Like if, a, I mean, it was, it was whoever could shoot the fastest. That's who got the deer, that's who got the, the bird, whatever it was. And then I met my wife and I met her dad. And if you all of you have been, if you've ever been fishing with me, this is where I got this attitude. I met my wife's dad before we were even married. He took me out deer hunting and he didn't even have a gun. And he didn't have any interest in hunting. He might have had a gun in the truck, but he didn't have any interest. It was all about putting me in the right spot. It was all about, you know, I saw this, this buck the other night, and we're going to go see if we can get, get this buck for you. And it was all about just giving me that experience, that successful hunt. He was, he's always been that way. And, but, but I grew up in such a different environment, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this guy, I mean, and, I mean the, the deer on my wall in my house, you've seen those. They're all from him. They're all from just his selfless, you know, attitude towards me. He wanted, look, and the joy, and look, now I have that same, I have that same attitude now. And if you'll notice, if you come out fishing with me, I don't really fish much. But I enjoy watching other people catch fish. And it's that attitude. It's so much fun for me. It's so much fun just to, to make sure that, you know, somebody that, especially somebody that's never really caught a fish before, especially somebody that's never been fishing, it is just the joy. It's just a great joy. I just rejoice in the fact 
that I could put them in the right spot, I could give them the right equipment, I could give them the right advice, show them how to do it, and then watch them reel in a fish that I didn't catch. I got that from my father-in-law. But it's all about, look, there is zero envy in that heart. There is zero covetousness in that type of heart. But guess what? There's great joy in it. There's great joy in it. You're like, oh, but he's not the one, you know, taking the shot. He's not the one, you know, catching that big fish or whatever. But the point is, we, re- we can rejoice, and it's fun. It is joyful watching other people be successful. And if you're envious, you're leaving that on the table, and you will never know what that's like. So we need to watch out for enviousness, or, you know, just having that envy just dig root in our heart, because ultimately, turn to Matthew, turn to Matthew chapter Matthew chapter number 28. Ultimately, how does it apply? How does it apply in our Christian lives? We have to get rid of envy, get rid of this idea that other people, you know, can't be more successful than us. Because you know what? It's not just all about going out and soul winning and just giving the gospel to somebody and getting somebody saved and then just walking away. That's not what it's supposed to be about. You know, there's something else that we're supposed to be doing in this Christian life. Look down at verse number 19. Actually, go up to verse number 18. We never read 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So he's saying, go out and teach all nations. He's saying, go out and teach them the gospel. Get them saved. Get them baptized. And then he says in verse number 20, teaching them to observe all things. How long would it take you to observe all things? How long would it take somebody? So verse number 19, you know, you could teach somebody that in about 30 minutes. You could teach somebody, you could preach the gospel to somebody, have somebody, you know, be passed from death to life in about 20, 30 minutes. Then they could get into church, they could get baptized. But how long is it going to take somebody to observe all things? And how are they going to know how to observe all things? What what do you mean all things? All things. Look, I'm not observing all things. I'm being taught to observe all things. So the Bible is saying is that we should disciple people. The Bible is saying we should go out, we should go so and we should preach the gospel to people. We should get people into church. We should get people baptized. And then we should teach them all things. But then when they start figuring things out, maybe they got different talents than we do, which I guarantee you every single person has different talents than all of us do. And then we're like, get envious? No, we should watch them and rejoice in them being successful as they observe all things. That's this Christian life. Look, you should be different next year than you are this year. All of you should be different If you are observing all things, unless you got it all figured out right now, every single one of us, including myself, should be better at verse number 20 than we are today. And it is true that not all people are going to grow at the same speed. Some people grow very slow. Some people people grow backwards. (laughs) No, that's not growth. But the point is, some people go backwards. Some people go forwards. Some people grow very quickly in this Christian life. And you can edify, I mean, we're here to edify each other. And as people go like this in the Christian life, hopefully we're all going forward together. Some people are going to go like this and, you know, I mean, it's just, it's going to be different all the time. Because observing all things will literally take you the rest of your physical life on this earth. And you will not get there. You will not get to, that's the last one, I got it. You will never perfect it. No one will. And if we have this envious thing where we're comparing each other, that's what Paul's saying. He's like, as you get in church, as you start growing, you're all going to grow at different speeds. You're all going to have different talents. You're all going to have different labors. People are going to do this over here. Just let them glory in that. You know, it's all for the glory of God. Don't go and be envious of somebody else's success, especially spiritual success in this Christian life. 
So yeah, it applies to things like work and success and things like that. But ultimately where it's important is in the spiritual life and the growth of a church. Because it's a bunch of us together here. This church is not just me, it's not just you. It's all of us together. Envy, envy should have no place among us. And it'll creep in here and there, but we should rejoice with one another. When somebody starts soul winning, that is a reason to rejoice. When somebody makes steps in their Christian life and maybe they separate from things in their life outside that they needed to separate from, that is something that we need to rejoice with them over. When people start implementing standards in their life, when people get married and start, you know, moving forward in that relationship that God has for them, we need to rejoice in that with them. And there should, envy will wreck all of this, is what Paul is trying to say. One, one measure will be here, one talent will be there. We all need to grow together. We all need to grow together, and it's not all going to be the same. And that's what Paul's talking about. Recognize envy and kill it. Kill it dead. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.